The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hello and welcome to Real Reviews. My name is Jameson Rabbit, and this week I am all alone with you to talk about a bunch of movies. No co-host this week, so again, I feel like you and I can just have a conversation about some movies that are playing in theaters. Also, we are in the month of October, so I have some really fun, um, spooky movies, I guess. Uh, maybe outside the norm for your ha Halloween-type movies, but uh, some really fun throwbacks to talk about. But first, let's get started with what we have on the marquee this week. And I'm going to start with the new film, new animated slash live action film, Lyle Lyle Crocodile from directors Josh Gordon and Will Speck. Uh, is a film that is based on a children's story. Uh, the film features Hector Valenti, who is played by Javier Bardem. He is a down on his luck entertainer, a singer, a dancer, a magician, kind of all around guy. He discovers a baby crocodile in the back of a pet store, and he finds that this baby crocodile can sing. So, he steals this crocodile and names him Lyle. You didn't see that coming. Uh, Hector sees uh, Lyle as his ticket to stardom. He has a singing crocodile. Uh, and so this launches us into our first song and dance number of many song and dance numbers in this movie, most of which feature the same song being repeated over and over. It gets a little old. Um, but it takes us forward in the story in an undetermined amount of time. Uh, we watch Lyle grow up from a baby to a full-size crocodile. Um, unfortunately, Lyle suffers from stage fright, which b ends up bankrupting Hector uh, as he tries to get him out on stage and he refuses to sing. Uh, and so Hector has to take his leave to go and hustle up some more money and find a way to... Um, try one more time to uh, take his chance at stardom, and he leaves Lyle locked in his attic. Um, again, we're not sure for how long. He's locked up in this attic for some period of time, but at some point, a new family moves in uh, with a young child named Josh. Josh is played by Winslow Fegley. Um, Josh is a nervous wreck in a new city. He's, he's terrified of everything. He's, he hears every sound in this house that's creaking, and he... And he hears something in the attic that leads him to discover a crocodile hiding upstairs. Um, and he and this crocodile become instant best friends, uh, which is shown to us the fact that they're best friends by the fact that Lyle takes young Josh out dumpster diving for food behind one of the local Chinese restaurants. And they're in the dumpster having a grand old time. And Josh never really act, reacts the same way you would if you actually saw a crocodile in your attic. Uh, you don't instantly befriend him. There's never really feels like there's a true reaction uh, to a crocodile walking around upright in the city. Uh, at one point, young Josh asks the crocodile, uh, you don't talk, do you? Which made me question how smart this kid was when the first thing he asked was whether this crocodile talked. But... Bright kid, nonetheless. Um, there's also this quick acceptance uh, when the mother, played by Constance Wu, discovers Lyle. Uh, and within minutes of discovering him, she's doing a choreographed song and dance number with a crocodile and baking a cake with him, as you would. Um, Lyle apparently seems to save this family from boredom. Even the father, uh, played by Scoot McNary, begrudgingly accepts the fact that now they have a... a a friend for their son, who is a crocodile. Um, and so he, he saves the family from boredom. He's the only friend that this kid has. But it's when Hector finally returns to the story. Javier Bardem and his character returns and wants to push Lyle back out on stage. He has a new idea for a new show. It's going to be great. Um, things start to get really super wonky at this part. When he... Do we take Lyle away? What does Lyle want? Uh... Has anybody thought about Lyle's feelings? Uh, it's, it's weird. It, it, you know, what's this family going to do without this crocodile that they just met? Um, there's also the subplot with the downstairs neighbor to them who um, has his precious cat. It's a character, Mr. Grumps, played by Brett Gelman, who he, he's fun. Brett Gelman, I mean, in Stranger Things, was one of the better things about this most recent season. And, and he's great in this role. I don't quite understand all the dynamics that were in play here, but um, 
this film felt like it was trying to go for like an E.T. type of storyline with this kid and this creature that he discovered, especially when government agents storm their place. Uh, that gives the film this real odd weight for a minute. It gets really serious. Uh, it feels really strange and out of nowhere as the government agents show up. Um, but so much of this film felt like it was barely a story. Uh, no one acted real in their interactions with this CGI crocodile. Uh, like I said, Brett Gelman was funny, but he always is. I thought Javier Bardem was great in this. I, I, he really didn't have a whole lot to do outside of singing the same song over and over again. Uh, but I enjoyed him. Poor Constance Wu deserved so much better than this. I mean, she just seemed like she was going through the motions. She realized what movie she was making, and she can do so much better. Um, but... Uh, Ultimately, I found Lyle Lyle Crocodile to be a kind of lackluster kids film. I'm not sure who the audience is that would enjoy this. Um, I end up giving Lyle Lyle Crocodile two out of five stars. It's just there. Uh, I wouldn't give it a high recommend for kids movies, though. Uh, moving ahead, though, uh, also on the marquee this week, I have a new film from director David O. Russell. It is his latest film called Amsterdam. This is a film that from the outset, uh, as this was being talked about, was assumed that it was going to be a big Oscar contender, but that doesn't seem to be so. Uh, one of the most acclaimed casts in recent times, I mean, this cast is deep with A-list stars, um, but it, the, the main three stars are uh, Christian Bale, who plays Burt Berenson, uh, John David Washington, who plays his friend Harold Woodman, and Margot Robbie, plays uh, Valerie Vose, and the three of them, as you see on screen, form this triumvirate that are the basis to the story. Um, it's, a, it's a film that's kind of all over the place in both story and in tone. Kind of a screwball noir comedy until it's not, but what it is is basically uh, Bert and Harold are soldiers in World War I. Both are seriously injured. Bert losing his right eye, which is comes into play several times in this film with his glass eye. Um, in the recovery, they meet a young nurse, Valerie, that's the Margot Robbie character, uh, whom they form a kinship with, a trio who they, uh, they support each other. They form the foundation of this film. Uh, and they, they say, going forward, we have to stick together. Uh, we flash forward a couple of years. Uh, Bert is now a doctor who treats war veterans with uh, some questionable techniques that he's created. Um, he's lost prestige amongst the upper crust that he was married into, mostly because of his war wounds that he came back with, despite the fact that his in-laws were the ones who basically forced him to go to war uh, unwillingly. Bert is now asked uh, by his business partner, Harold, John David Washington's character, to perform an autopsy on a man who is important to both of them, their former commanding officer, who died under mysterious uh, circumstances. His daughter, who is played by Taylor Swift, believes that he was poisoned. Um, so this brings about a murder mystery plot in which these two men are embroiled uh, as both suspects and kind of as private eyes trying to solve this mystery. They bring in Margot Robbie into the mix. She has her own issues post-World War I, uh, and her family entanglements start to spin this really confusing web as we keep introducing more and more characters and, and issues. There's also a big plot in this film concerning actual events in 1933 revolving around an attempt to unseat the President of the United States and replace him to change the balance of power as fascism was beginning to sweep its way around the globe. This is an actual thing that happened uh, in, in our nation's history. And uh, it kind of serves as a really confusing set piece for this film. Uh, but it, it's kind of served to introduce a whole host of actors and crazy characters. And I mean, this, this list of actors, if you're watching, you see... Uh, on the screen as they ran down the cast, but outside of the ones I mentioned, you have Anya Taylor-Joy shows up as uh, uh, Valerie's sister. You have Rami Malek, uh, who is with Anya Taylor-Joy. Chris Rock is in here as uh, a guy who's trying to give advice to the, the triumvirate, as it were. Um, Mike Myers and Michael Shannon are two partners. Mike Myers is a, a guy who uh, sells glass eyes as a front for being a spy. So he is like this glass eye uh, emporium that he runs. Uh, he and Michael Shannon are actually a couple of government spies uh, who are also obsessed with bird watching. 
me, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, you also have Zoe Saldana as a pseudo love interest for Christian Bale's character. Timothy Oliphant shows up uh, randomly as a villain who is kind of trying to push the fascism angle of everything going on. Matthias Schoenert as a detective trying to take them all down. And then lastly, Robert De Niro uh, shows up as General Gil Dellenbeck, who uh, plays the kind of the true portion of the story about the... Uh, the push to unseat the uh, president, but it's 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 all over the place. There's a large section of this film where I didn't feel like I truly had a footing on where we were or what was happening or why it was happening. Um, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, most of the film is spun as like slapstick comedic, but it's rarely funny. Um, it has a message that seemed to me to be how politics and big business kind of are dangerous partners to our democracy and how the little people are the ones who get trampled when the two of these powers uh, are working together. And so we have to make sure to, to love each other and to support each other uh, because we can't look to businesses and, and governments to do so. But I'm only guessing because it, it's, it was all over the place. Um, so many themes and so many characters are introduced in this movie that aren't followed through on. It's just a big, messy movie and it's really it was really difficult for me to comprehend much less explain to you especially without giving away any spoilers i think there's some really fun performances in this film uh it's a beautiful looking film uh but the failures really to me come from the direction of uh of everything and the editing specifically the editing made things really confusing I really enjoyed Mike Myers. I really enjoyed Michael Shannon as partners in this weird thing. I wish that we could have gotten more of them and more explanation of them. Uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is great, of course. And every time a new name is mentioned, they'll say a character's name. Oh, you need to go talk to so-and-so. And you begin to just expect A-list actors coming through every time they say a name. So that was kind of the interesting part of it. Um, ultimately, I, I think it was fun actors saying fun things that don't always make sense. Um, I would kind of like to make another attempt at this movie, um, but it was a big letdown for me. I had high expectations because of the prestige of the cast and the director. I mean, David O. Russell is a guy who made some amazing films like The Fighter and Silver Linings Playbook, American Hustle, I Heart Huckabees. These are great movies that he's made, and this was a, a real miss for me as far as that goes. But um, I ended up giving it a really tepid two and a half out of five stars more for the performances that I enjoyed than the story itself. The story itself was, I don't know, I wish you luck if you go watch this because uh, I, I hope you understand what's going on more than I did. And it seems to be kind of the running theme with this movie uh, as I uh, look around and see people just kind of scratching their heads with uh, what this movie was. And maybe it was, a, maybe it was an issue with you know, coming out of the pandemic. This film was shot during the pandemic. That can throw things off when not everyone's available in the same place. But uh, Amsterdam ultimately gets a very meh, mediocre two and a half out of five stars for me. Um, this week, though, I, I have a couple of, I'd mentioned at the top of the show, a couple of really fun uh, horror movies. I'm not a big horror guy. Uh, if you've watched this show before, you know I, I don't have a lot of patience for mediocre horror, especially bad horror. I do enjoy the, the good stuff, and we've had some great ones so far this year with films like Barbarian and Pearl that I've highly recommended. Um, and so I do enjoy tracking down really interesting ones, uh, especially ones that I maybe haven't seen in a while. And so for our throwback this week, I brought two very different horror films from the past that I wanted to talk about. The first one is a film called Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. This is an interesting film. stars Michael Rooker, directed by John McNaughton. It was shot in 1985, but was not released until 1990. Uh, for a lot of different reasons that I'll get into. But it stars Michael Rooker as the titular Henry. Uh, this is a low-budget, high-intensity look at a semi-fictional serial killer. It's based off of um, a real serial killer, Henry Lucas. Um, but I figured with all the rehashing and the spotlight back on Jeffrey Dahmer lately, as Jeffrey Dahmer seems to be on the tips of everyone's tongues because of the Netflix series and various documentaries that have come out, um, I thought we'd talk about this. This is a cold look at what a serial killer actually looked like. Just the guy next door who just kills people. Uh, it's a film that really gets into the mind of Henry, how he chose his victims, how unaffected he was by killing, and the double life that he led as a regular guy who also 
uh, killed people. It's shot in a very run and gun style, filled with unknowns. This was uh, Michael Rooker's first acting role. He was a janitor who just tried out for this role. It's a film that drew massive outrage on its release. Uh, it was shot in 1985 for $110,000 and really struggled to find distribution. Initially was given an X rating uh, and ultimately ended up being one of the first films to ever receive an NC-17 rating for a film, an adult film uh, without you know nudity but extreme violence. Um, and it finally started to get its wide release in 1990. At that point, Michael Rooker was already a known actor, uh, which makes it always really interesting when one of these films shows up later on. But it's a slow burn with Michael Rooker showing his ability to really turn on a dime. And I think he's really a master at that as a character actor of being a guy who you can't trust uh, in his characters because even here in his first role, you see he plays charming, regular guy, but there's always something beneath the surface with him. Uh, and in this flick, we see that especially. He has a roommate named Otis, who is played by Tom Tolles. Um, Otis also brings his sister, Becky, played by Tracy Arnold, to live with them. Uh, Otis might have feelings for Henry, uh, which are going to play in some weird dynamics with them. And uh, the relationship between Henry and Otis uh, is kind of the key to this film as Henry befriends him, kind of pushes Otis, challenges him, often bullies him, uh, and teaches him how to kill without remorse. Uh, and... Uh, What's interesting, though, is that the character of Henry as a serial killer isn't um, isn't just a straight psychopath, right? Isn't just a, out there, a killer out there running the streets. He has a set of morals that he lives by, which is always interesting to me when you deal with someone like this. Like, I'll do this, but I won't do that. I'll do this heinous thing, but I won't do that because that goes against my morals. And that... Uh, comes into play here, especially when it comes to dealing with Otis's sister, Becky. Henry is protective of her. Uh, but even you see in one scene where they're killing a family and Otis wants to do something to the, to the corpse of the wife and, Otis, and Henry says, no, no, Otis, we're not doing that. Like, it's against my, it's against my rules. Um, so that you see that there are emotions in the character of Henry. Uh, we also see as Otis kind of gains this bloodlust that Henry helps him with. But for Henry, killing isn't a crime. It's, it's just a way of passing time. We see in the movie, it's a way of killing boredom for him, no pun intended. And that is really chilling. Uh, there's the scene where they, they have a camcorder and they videotape themselves torturing and murdering an entire family in their house which is horrific to watch, but then they re-watch this videotape just to entertain themselves. And that's even more horrifying that they're just watching this and giggling and rewinding it. Um, it's a film that really doesn't shy away from the really hard moments. Uh, it's not a slasher film. You know, thinking about when this was shot in 1985, we're at the height of the slasher craze in American horror cinema. Uh, this is very much not a slasher film uh, with a, you know, a crazed, faceless killer running the streets. It's really just a regular guy stalking those streets and killing when he feels like it or when he's bored or when he just needs something. Um, and so it's not really like a splashy thriller. You, again, you, know, you see it's very low budget. It's not a film where a detective is trying to track down a killer. It's not your Silence of the Lambs style or anything like that. It's really just living a few days in the life and in the mind of a serial killer, thus the title, Portrait of a Serial Killer. And that's kind of more terrifying than anything, is just kind of being there with him and uh, seeing the world through his eyes for a few days. It's uh, pretty horrifying stuff, but uh, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer, is really a, a spectacular movie and a spectacular uh, look at horror from a different direction than you normally get. So uh, uh, go check it out. If you want to. Again, it's NC-17 for a reason. So maybe don't bring the kids. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the first throwback for this week. Also, I wanted to go back a little further into something that I really enjoy. I'm a big fan of Universal Monster movies. Uh, and I think there's none better than the one I'm going to talk about here. came out in 1935. It is The Bride of Frankenstein from director James Whale. This is a sequel to the original 1931 Frankenstein movie, also directed by James Whale. Uh, at the time, he was doing a lot of these movies. He did Invisible Man and many other early classics of cinema. But this is a return to the scene of the crime. 
You see there Boris Karloff comes back for his role as Frankenstein's monster. Colin, uh, Colin Cave returns as Henry Frankenstein. And the film opens with Mary Shelley, who you know is the author of the Frankenstein story. Mary Shelley, the character of her, telling the continuation of the story of Dr. Frankenstein and his monster. They were both presumed dead last we saw them at the end of the first film. Uh, with the townsfolk believing the monster to have perished in the fire, we soon find that he had survived uh, and is just as dangerous as ever. His creator, Dr. Frankenstein, Henry Frankenstein, uh, also thought to be dead after being thrown from the top of the windmill at the climax of the original film, suddenly awakens in his father's castle on what would be his wedding night, seemingly very okay. Uh, there, a man comes a call in, a mysterious, creepy man who, calling himself Dr. Pretorius, played by Ernest Thiesinger. Um, he is Henry's former mentor, uh, and he has an urgent matter for Henry Frankenstein. Uh, he wants to partner up because he has also created life in his own laboratory, and his creations are much less monstrous. Uh, he has created miniature people, uh, maybe 10 inches tall, that he has in glass jars. Uh, he, and he's given them job titles. He's created a king. He's created a queen, a mermaid, a bishop, uh, a, a ballerina, and a devil. Uh, and he wants to use the combined knowledge of he and Dr. Frankenstein to uh, create full-sized people that are actual people. He's given these people thought uh, as opposed to the monster that Frankenstein committed. And I love the old effects in this, uh, these people in the glass jars. I, it cracks me up every time thinking that this guy created these little people and then gave them job titles. <laughs> He's creating life and putting them in jars. Like, you're going to be a bishop. Uh, anyways. Uh, the two of these 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 two uh, doctors uh, toast to a new world of gods and monsters, and and uh, Doctor Pretorius convinces Henry that if they are to be gods, they must create the Eve to Frankenstein's Adam. Uh, so meanwhile, Frankenstein's monster is roaming the lush countryside in his ill-fitting suit, uh, and he stumbles upon the home of a blind man who welcomes him in, very happy to have a guest. A friend. Uh, the two of them become friends very quickly. Uh, this blind man teaches the monster to speak, uh, to enjoy drinks, to enjoy smokes, uh, and that not all fire to, fire is necessarily bad. Uh, and there's, this is a, just an incredible section of this film uh, as the monster kind of becomes human. And we see him shed a tear as the blind man is praying for him. It's, an, it's a remarkable sequence. And we see that this monster has got heart. But all anyone can see is the fact that he's a monster. Uh, so you have these double mad scientists. You have a monster who returns home to Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. A very different monster. Uh, his English has progressed remarkably. He's able to speak in complete sentences now, which is always a little weird feeling to see. Um, but we are presented once again with the question of who's the real monster? Is it this creation who didn't ask to be created, this abomination as they say? Or is it these two men who are trying to become gods and create life? Who's the real monster? I think you know what the answer to that is. Um, but, of course, this is a movie called The Bride of Frankenstein. I've been talking about this movie for a while, never mentioned The Bride. That's because The Bride doesn't appear until the final minutes of this film. Finally, we create The Bride. She shows up, but she is a scene stealer. Uh, an image for all time uh, is you have... Uh, Elsa Lancaster, who plays the dual role of Mary Shelley in the beginning and the bride at the end. Uh, I mean, the, the, the hair with that shock of white lightning bolt going through it. Uh, the great moment where she opens her eyes and Dr. Frankenstein yells, She's alive! Alive! That's a scene that I had only seen in Weird Science before I saw this movie. I knew it from them watching it in Weird Science, and here it is in his... I mean, these are... These are huge moments. And so we see the meet cute between Frankenstein's monster and his bride. But things don't end so well for this cute couple. And uh, this film is so hugely influential and, and put forth a lot of interesting ideas for its time that are still argued about to this day. The relationship between Dr. Frankenstein and Dr. Pretorius is still argued about. You know, what's going on there? 
And it's, it's, in my mind, it's the best Frankenstein movie we've ever gotten. It's a stone-cold classic. Just absolutely love it. The sets in this movie are amazing. The height of 1930s set making. I absolutely adore those. I absolutely love the, the classic makeup that they use on all these characters, specifically the monster. But the bride is so incredible looking. And just the right amount of overacting in this movie of that time, acting to the back of the theater. I, I enjoy that. It's just an all-time classic monster movie. So I highly recommend, if you haven't seen Bride of Frankenstein or it's been a while, throw it on. We're in October. Throw on a great classic monster movie and enjoy that. Um, talking about other movies, let's take a look ahead at what is coming soon, though. I'm looking at the weekend of October 21st. We've got a whole host of movies coming out that week. First off, we have a film called Black Adam, which is the newest film in the DC franchise. Dwayne Johnson finally stars as the big DC villain Black Adam. He is uh, kind of the yin to the yang of uh, Shazam. We are also getting a Shazam movie, which two very different films totally one a comedy. Black Adam much darker, but of course it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson in the uh, suit as a superhero. Everyone's been wanting to see that. That's coming up October 21st. We also have Ticket to Paradise, which stars Julia Roberts and George Clooney as a divorced couple who band together to try and sabotage their daughter's wedding because they don't approve of her husband. Um, but uh, the big question is, will these two gorgeous people rekindle their romance. Boy, I really hope so, because they're great. Uh, that's Ticket to Paradise. We also have The Banshees of Insurin uh, from director Martin McDonough, who has made some of my favorite films the last 15 years. Uh, most recently, Three Billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, uh, Seven Psychopaths, In Bruges. Uh, this film stars his In Bruges uh, star, um, Colin Farrell again, as well as Brendan Gleeson, the most recent host of Saturday Night Live, uh, in an intense comedy drama that uh, I don't know a whole lot about, and that's just fine, but I'm sure that it's going to most likely be incredible. So that's the Banshees of Insurin. We also have uh, on our streaming films, uh, on Netflix, The School for Good and Evil. Director Paul Feig uh, directs this. Two friends are swept away to a school where aspiring uh, heroes and villains are trained to protect the balance of good and evil. This has a crazy cast. Sophia Ann Caruso, Sophie Wiley, uh, Kate Blanchett, Kerry Washington, Charlize Theron, Michelle Yeoh. Really great cast. It looks like it's going to be really fun over on Netflix. We also have on Apple TV a film called Raymond and Ray, about half-brothers Raymond and Ray, who reunite after the loss of their father and discover that he's left a final mission for these brothers to uh, possibly reunite them and help them process who they've become as adults. And this stars Ethan Hawke and Ewan McGregor. Pretty great sounding to me. Uh, that's Raymond and Ray. And then lastly, over on Hulu, we have a film called Worm, uh, set in an alternate 1990s. Uh, it's an awkward teen who must compete, uh, complete a school requirement uh, in which they wear an electronic collar that only detaches once they engage in their first kiss. This sounds insane to me. Uh, but it's going to be over on Hulu, and that is Worm. Uh, those are all the films for October 21st. Before we go any further, we want to thank our sponsor, Marcus Theaters. The Palace here in Sun Prairie, thank you for sponsoring this program. We do appreciate it. We love all your support. Uh, and uh, I look forward to going to see some movies. As soon as I get out of the studio here, I'm going to the Palace. I'm going to watch some movies. Next week... Uh, it's going to be an interesting show. We have the final movie in the Laurie Strode trilogy, the uh, Michael Myers slasher flick, Halloween Ends. They say this is the final one. i uh, let you believe that. Uh, we also have over on Netflix a family horror movie, quote unquote, uh, called The Curse of Bridge Hollow. Uh, we'll also have a fun throwback movie, and I'm going to be joined by my good friend Jason Spencer, friend of the show we've had on here a few times. He's going to be here with me to talk about all these films and uh, probably some other nonsense. So make sure you tune in for that next week. If you want to find any more from me or the show or communicate with us, uh, we are over on social media. You can find us, Real Reviews K-Sun, Real Reviews TV, or join in on the discussion of all things film. If you're on Facebook, we have a group called the Movie Mojo Maniacs that uh, Real Reviews is a part of, and we love conversing with our fans and friends and uh, doing polls and all kinds of stuff. So join us over there. We look forward to seeing you. 
Until next week, though, when I'm talking about Michael Myers, I'm Jameson, and have a great week.